Hello, and welcome back to yet another Retro Channel. Today on the bench, we have the Apple II Plus again, and we are working right now on the keyboard. Now, I have been working on this keyboard for a little while, um, and I actually, I got so close, I had one key that wasn't working. Everything else was working. Some of the keys were getting bounced, double or double characters, um, but that I can deal with that. But I had one key that wasn't working at all, the question mark and, and forward slash key. So a little while ago, I took it back apart and uh, tried to get things uh, working there. And in the process, I messed something else up. Um, I know I haven't tested all the keys, but I know the shift, one of the shifts is stuck on. Now they're both moving as they should, but I probably, uh, well, you'll see when I get inside the contacts, I probably bent them a little too far on one of them. Um, so, as I said, I've been working on restoring this keyboard, and I was able to do so thanks to the generous donation of one of my viewers, Dev Rosick. Uh, Dev sent me uh, an identical keyboard that he had been trying to fix and been unable to, uh, that I could use for spare parts, and I was able to take the key stem and the key uh, cap for the, the right-hand shift key, which was missing from, well, the the keycap was missing and the stem was broken off of this keyboard. So I was able to get that and repair that. And I'm also using it for some other spare parts you'll see inside. So now let's go ahead and get this keyboard open and I'll show you what we're dealing with. Now I have already mo removed the encoder board and it's over here. Uh, when you're removing these, these uh, locking standoffs you need to pinch them to pull the, the board up and be very careful of these pins here you don't want to break any of those off because obviously that would uh, be hard to re hard to replace or repair and without them um, the keyboard won't work so be careful with those and also be careful with this um, dip socket ribbon connector uh, these pins, again, you don't want to bend or break them. It would make it very difficult for this thing to work. So I protect those when I'm taking it off by putting it on this piece of styrofoam to protect the pins. And set that aside where it's safe. And then we have to remove all these little screws. Now there is, uh, along with the, the screws directly into the board, there is... Uh, this bracket here, which I assume is for rigidity and strength, so that has to come off. I am using a couple of books here to hold the keyboard up off the surface so the keys aren't pressed. That definitely helps in aligning everything if the keys aren't pushing down. As usual, I'm using one of my little magnetic uh, dishes to hold the screws so I don't lose any of them. And this isn't my first time and it probably won't be my last time taking this apart. So you want to lift up pretty much straight because on the other side of this PCB, there are, well, there are the contacts, but there is a piece of mylar protecting uh, from any unwanted contact in areas that, uh, that might otherwise cause a problem. Well, one of the things I often have trouble with is keeping the uh, shift key aligned. Now, you won't be able to see this probably very well, but uh, I'll try to do a zoom in the final cut. Um, a lot of these key switches have uh, posts that go through this hole. Uh, you'll see a lot of these are long strips. Some of them are individuals. Some of them are a few at a time. And some of them are, see, this one has two keys attached. One key, one key, 
whole rows, whole rows, whole rows. To repeat is uh, repeat is over here, and it is stuck. It looks like. So, Let's take repeat off and then we'll get back to that shift key over there. See each of these little leaf springs, there's two parts. There's a copper piece here, and this is the spring that pushes the key up. And then there's a second piece that goes over the top. And this is the piece with the contacts. So you have these are two contacts that, that touch contact points on the PCB. And these two are contact points that touch, sorry, that touch the PCB. And when the key is pressed down, well, at all times, these contacts touch, or su are supposed to touch. These carry the pulse from the encoder circuit, or the encoder IC. And then these receive the, or receive the pulse and send it back when the key is pressed down. So, yeah, those need to be lifted up. Now this needs to be pushing down. In this case, down up in the in the reality of the how this thing works. So first, the copper piece goes in, and it slides over this nub, and in this case, there isn't a nub on that side. We'll put the copper piece on. This is why this is so fiddly and so annoying. Now, I did knock the space bar off. There's another problem. If you don't get those nubs aligned correctly when you put the board back on, the nubs also push through the PCB to help align the PCB. So if you get them slightly off, you can bend this out of shape. And there we go. So now I'm going to take this one off. I'm not sure which of the space or the shift keys is causing the problem. So uh, I have to make sure both of them are lined up correctly. Come on. I think that's too high. I think that's what's causing the shift to stay on. There we go. So let's realign both of these pieces. This one you'll see is a little different. Any that don't have the nub on this side, it's because a screw goes through there and holds that in position. Screw there, screw there. So you'll see those are a little different. Now, Uh, because I was having a problem with that key, I am going to give these a little IPA clean. Okay, I think everything is in alignment, at the moment at least. Now here's where everything always goes wonky. When I go to put the PCB back on, it pushes things out of the, out of their normal alignment unless I get it just right the first time. So 
So now what you need to do is look and make sure all the nubs are coming through the right holes and that none are blocked by little pieces of aluminum. That would mean that the little leaf springs are aligned wrong. Looks like I got it right this time, at least for the moment. So it's time to start putting some of the screws back. And the really sad thing about this whole deal is that to test, you have to put it all the way back together. You can't test with just some of the screws in because the screws hold the board down against the resistance of the leaf springs. You also want to look along the edges and make sure that the PCB is sitting down. I may not have the bulb coming through correctly. No, it's, it's in there. That PCB is just a little, or actually I think it's, this piece of plastic is a little warped. Now we'll come in with the rigidity bar. I'm going to put the screws in loosely at first and tighten down the center ones before I tighten the outer ones. And then it's just a matter of putting in all the rest of these little screws. And there are a ton of them. Okay, that's the, all, the, that's all the screws from the little dish. And it's all the holes filled. Okay. Now we can put the encoder board back being careful to get all the pins lined up so you don't bend or break any of them And then reconnect the keyboard to the motherboard. Now, the good news here is that in testing the keyboard, I've actually also been testing the motherboard. And it turns out the motherboard is actually in pretty good shape. I did have to replace one memory IC right here. Um, in the D6 position. Um, Apple Cillin detected it as bad. Some other diagnostics didn't, but I, uh, I swapped that out when Apple Cillin uh, came up with it. Um, the memory card, the Microsoft memory card, uh, what some people call the language card, but it isn't actually a language card on the 2 Plus, um, it's working. The Disk 2 controller is working, and I have my uh, floppy emu hooked up and it is set I, I believe what it's going to pull up is the official apple diagnostics uh, dealer diagnostics that's what it's called so when we power this up we should get uh, diagnostics to run got the beep that's a good sign and should get the screen in a moment there it is Okay, so I'm going to go down to the keyboard test. So far, so good. Now, let's see. Nope, the shift is still on. Those, those beeps are actually um, when the keys uh, bounce. And the repeat stuck. Great. Okay. The repeat needs, I think, a little bit of grease to work properly. Uh, the repeat is on. Ah, great. Okay. 
Here we go again. Okay, once more unto the breach. The P is still stuck. Ugh. Okay, well, after much faffing about, I actually ended up giving up, at least for now, on my original keyboard for this Apple II Plus. Uh, I just was never able to get it all aligned. I was having particular trouble with this key right here, which is the uh, forward slash and the question mark. Um, I was never able to get that key to work correctly. It would either always be pressed, essentially, or never be pressed. Um, I don't remember how much I explained of this, but the way this keyboard works is you have three parts. You have the PCB with the contacts. You have the encoder board with a set of pin headers that come through the PCB um, to deliver the signals to and from the keyboard. And of course the encoder chip and a few other bits of logic. Um, and then you have the keyboard itself. Now the way this works, the encoder chip sends out signals, pulses on uh, several of these pins and it looks for the pulses to come back on other pins and it, it knows based on a matrix whether or which key is being pressed by knowing which pulse went out and which pulse came back. So the pulses when they come through uh, from the pins or from the uh, when they come through from the encoder chip through the pin, the pins then connect to traces on the PCB uh, the pulse traces go through to uh, contact points that go that sit between the keys, and there will be at least one for each uh, set of keys that are being trapped. Those pulses that come off the board then contact these little raised contacts here. And that puts the pulse, in the case of a multiple key, it puts the pulse on every key that's connected to it. You see there's no connection here. This is a single key. I don't know why some of them are single and some of them are multiple. That's the way they did it. So the pulse comes through on these. And then if the key is being pressed, these small contacts here will contact 
these contact points on the PCB and send the pulse back uh, through the traces onto the return pin. And the encoder chip watches and knows, as I said, uh, based on which pulse went out and which pulse came back, it knows which key is being pressed. So what was happening with this keyboard, um, I had all the keys working except for one. And that was, I said, as I said, this one right here. And its contact point is here. Or actually, I think it's this one. Um, this is where the pulse comes in. And then the pulse would need to go back through these contact points right here. And what was happening, or at least what seemed to be happening, was these contact points were never exactly aligned right. Uh, in the z-axis up and down so when i put the pcb back on the keyboard either these contacts would always be making contact in which case there was always a continuous path or if i if i got them low enough that um that, that they didn't make constant contact then when i actually pressed the key they still didn't make contact i could never find the right balance so what I did was this. I gave up on this keyboard, at least for now. I'll probably go back to it at some point in the future and see if I can get it working. But for now, I gave up on it. And what I did is I had the keyboard that was sent to me by viewer Dev Rossick. Um, he was very generous and sent me that keyboard. Uh, he said he had been unable to repair it. It didn't come with an encoder board. So I, had, I used my encoder board from the original keyboard which was working fine. And I went ahead and put it back, put this keyboard back together and tested it. And sure enough, the keyboard itself actually works. So um, I went ahead and put the computer back together to make sure and, you know, to, uh, to give it a test. So hopefully this will work this time. Um, I have the motherboard i have the memory card and i have the disk 2 uh, controller card in the board and i have my floppy emu here floppy emu floppy emu i'm not sure how you're supposed to say it um and i have loaded up the apple II dealer diagnostics or at least i think i do there we go we've got the apple II dealer diagnostics now i've run this through uh the RAM test, I'm not going to do that again. I've run it through the motherboard ROM test, and I've actually run it through the keyboard test, but we'll do that again for you here so you can see that this keyboard is actually working. Okay, that's all the keys. Everything works. So we now have a working keyboard, apparently working motherboard, um, working memory card, and working disk 2 controller along with the power supply. And I'm going to just to show you here what we've got. I don't know how to play this game, but uh, Adrian Black seems to like it quite a bit, so I'm going to load this up for you here. Ooh, retro tank. There we go. There we go. So you can uh, you can see now, Fat City is working. Uh, I can play it with the keyboard. I really don't, uh, as I said, know how to play this game, but I can show you a little bit. There you go. 
So the Apple II is basically working, and uh, the next time we get it out, we'll be exploring some add-on cards uh, that I also got from viewer uh, Dev Rossick. Uh, he was, again, very generous and uh, made me a great deal on some add-on cards that we'll be taking a look at. I have uh, a couple of uh, Videx cards. I have a mocking board, and I think a couple other things I don't remember for sure. But that will be what we will be doing next time with the Apple II. And in the meantime, um, that'll be it for today. And I'm glad you uh, <laughs> put up with this video to the end. I know it wasn't the most interesting video. It wasn't the most electronic video I've ever done. Most of it was, was very mechanical in nature. Uh, I chose to do it because, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, um, I went looking for videos on this particular keyboard, the ITT uh, Snap Action Array RFI compliant keyboard by the very imaginatively named The Keyboard Company. And I couldn't, I, I found a video on YouTube of someone showing one, but not of anyone actually trying to repair one. So I thought maybe it would be useful to some folks in the future, you know, to go over how the keyboard was meant, you know, how it was. Uh, configured how it was designed and uh, let you see my valiant yet ultimately not very fruitful efforts to repair it. But if you enjoyed the video, uh, you know what to do there. Give it a like, thumbs up, go ahead and leave me a comment. Um, let me know what you thought of the video or anything you think I could have done differently or, uh, uh, or whatever. I, I do love interacting with you folks. So please, uh, feel free to leave a comment. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to get an alert when I post a new video, you can click the notification bell. I do have, um, I keep forgetting to mention this in my videos recently, I do have a Discord server uh, that you can join and uh, that link will be provided here. Uh, I also have a Facebook group that you can uh, join to. Uh, all these are other ways that we can interact with each other. And uh, again, I, I, I love the interaction with you guys. That's that's kind of what's keeping me going with this is, is uh, you, know, you guys communicating with me and, and passing on information, sharing information. And and uh, I love the community that uh, that's built up around retro computing. I also have a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the channel, you can go to Patreon. Uh, I have a Ko-Fi and I now have a channel membership. So if you would like to join the channel and support the channel, I would greatly appreciate that. The link should be somewhere down here. <laughs> I th think that's everything I have to address at the end here. Again, I appreciate you guys watching. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks. See you later.